there's a little bit about IO uh, today on the, and maybe uh, next next one. Uh, <coughs> so I'll not really go deep into any of the IO devices. Uh, just show you how IO really happens in the data path from the CPU down to the uh, data. Uh, and that's touch upon uh, the related topics. That's pretty much it. So here's the agenda. Um, so we look at uh, communication protocols with IO devices. Um, talk a little bit about magnetic disk, which is one of the IO devices that you probably use the most. Talk about how to make disks reliable and dependable. That's uh, through RAID, uh, which stands for uh, redundant array of inexpensive disks. Then we talk about uh, direct memory access and virtual memory. So we have seen a uh, lot about virtual memory and we look at uh, one way of doing uh, IO and how it interacts with virtual memory. Um, talk a little bit about asynchronous IO um, and uh, interaction with cash So a little bit about the hardware, uh, hardware IO buses. Uh, this is probably the, the only slide that talks about really the standards and all those things. There are many, so that's really the summary. Here it lists only a few. It's all the common ones that you see. So you must have heard of the PCI bus. So that stands for Peripheral Component Interconnect. Um, so, okay, so by the way, before that, um, a particular uh, the system looks something like this. So uh, let's say this is your uh, last level cache controller. So you've seen that side very much. We've spent most of the semester looking at that side. The processor pipeline and the cache hierarchy and all these things. Uh, we've talked a little bit about memory controllers as well. to other things, for example, your radio interface card, it also connects to the, to the, the disk controller, and to the array of disks that, that hang from here. Although nothing stops you from connecting the GPU to the memory control directly also. Uh, it used to be the case with the old Intel graphics, the AGP connectors and all. And your IO controller also hand, uh, connects to the other IO devices, uh, like again, an IO device that we use frequently. That's probably the, one of the most important things. Keyboard, right? Now the mouse. CD drives. Sorry, what? Printer. Sorry? The printer. The printer. The printer, exactly. Yes, yes. So various other things. Okay, so this is what roughly um, um, looks like. Um, and uh, often this particular controller is called the South Bridge. So it's an, it's an old nomenclature. Uh, because originally when 
the, the personal computers came out, this one was called the North Bridge, the memory controller. And this one was called the South Bridge, just based on the location of these. Um, but memory controller today is actually, um, has got closer to the LLC. In fact, uh, this whole thing will be in a single chip. So I'll often refer to this particular bus as the front side bus. This is again an old name uh, coming from the Intel um, chipsets. Uh, when memory controller was the North Bridge, uh, it would connect to the processor through the front side bus. But anyway, what I really mean is the bus that connects the LLC controller to the memory controller. So this is what it looks like. So uh, the PCI, so this is the PCI bus. This so the PCI and PCI-X, PCI-X stands for uh, PCI Express. It's a, it's a faster, uh, uh, it's a next generation PCI bus, faster than the PCI. Uh, it connects a memory controller, peripheral devices like video card to IO bus adapters. Okay, so, so whenever you want to connect, you usually require an adapter or, the, or a bridge, that's what it's called. Actually. When you're connecting a device to the PCI slot of your computer, you get a bridge which would translate the protocol from the PCI protocol to whatever protocol you're connecting. Okay. For example, here you translate from PCI to SCSI, for example. Okay. Um, so um, here are some, some uh, buses that are often used with, uh, with the magnetic disks. So um, IDE or ultra, Ata. So, does anybody know what these things stand for? Integrated Electronics. Integrated Device Electronics. What does this one stand for? Advanced Technology Attachment. What does this one stand for? SCSI. Small Computer System Interface. So, um, so essentially these are popular parallel I.O. bus standards for connecting to storage devices like this you can see. Um, so you'll, you'll often find ATA comes with two, two names, serial ATA, the XATA, and parallel ATA. You will probably never see parallel ATA because when you say just ATA, that actually means parallel ATA. Otherwise, you would actually mention SATA, serial uh, agnostic one device. So PCI buses are much wider, 32 or 64 bits, compared to ATA or SCSI. PCI and PCI-X are synchronous buses, and you can see that the, the frequency difference, PCI-X is the next generation, which has, we can be clocked at a higher rate. Um, and today, pretty much all machines routinely use PCI-X. ATA and SCSI are asynchronous buses. Um, so what this means is that, um, these are normally accessed through an asynchronous handshake. There is no uh, clock that uh, synchronizes uh, accesses. So um, when it is asynchronous, we can talk about throughput. We cannot be talking about the frequency. So ATA throughput can be at most 100 megahertz, whereas SCSI throughput can be 10 to 160 megahertz. So it's very flexible in terms of the handshake speed. And ATA can have only one bus cluster, while others can have one. So I'll, I'll actually stop here about these protocols, because there are many more. You can just go on talking about these. And the standards, definitions, and all these things are there. Um, you can look them up uh, wherever you want. Okay. So, um, so let's see how actually you do I. Okay. There are normally two ways of doing it. One is called uh, memory mapped I.O. and the other one is called I.O. mapped I.O. So let's look at memory mapped I.O. first of all. So I.O. device registers, in this case, are mapped to these. CPU memory space. So essentially, whenever you talk about, let's say, printer's command register, that will actually have an address. So it will be mapped to, you be given some memory address, which the CPU can directly address. So these addresses are usually marked unmapped, because these are actually physical addresses, not virtual addresses. So you can also translate them. And uncached is the TLB entries. Okay. Um, so these are never cached, um, for obvious reasons, because probably you won't have any use on these particular locations. You would set the command and just fire the device. And of course, there is no point caching these uh, read writes because you really don't talk to the device directly. You don't want to put the store in the cache and be done. That's not really done. If you want to program the command register on the printer, you would send the bytes to the command register on the printer. 
So load store from to these addresses initiate the actual IU operation. So the paths are exactly same. It will actually start from the processor pipeline, these load store instructions. But since these are uncached, it will bypass the caches okay. and directly go on this bus. Right? So the memory controller will collect them, these requests, look at the address and decode it. Okay. And you find that, well, they do not belong to this particular space. It will first find it out. Okay. And we'll hand over the address to the IO controller to figure out what to do next. So uh, memory controller decodes the address and usually forwards it to the PCI adapter for further inspection. Okay. And of course, for, on further inspection, we'll find out which device it actually addresses, whether it addresses your, your uh, GPU or it addresses your mouse or keyboard or whatever it is. Yeah. And uh, these load store instructions would normally be part of some system called handling. Okay. Uh, for example, when you're trying to initiate a print command, you would probably be doing some system call, which would, which would be which would be invoking these load store operations to initiate the printer. Right? Um, so system call handlers would write to the data and control registers of the target IO device to initiate the process. So for example, uh, to start a printing operation, you probably send a particular command to the printer saying that start printing. Before that, you probably send the data also. So as the data streams in, the printer will start. So is this clear? So this is fairly simple. Uh, it doesn't require much change in the in the processor. They look like load store operations. Only thing is that these load store operations, when they will look up the data TFE for the first time, they will know that these are uncached addresses and these are unmapped addresses. So that will allow them to bypass the cache, go directly on the bus, and the rest of the things will be handled the memory control and IO. The second type is IO mapped IO. Uh, this used to be supported in uh, old x86 machines uh, and even supported today in certain machines. So here you expose the IO devices to the ISA. So essentially what this means is that you have special opcodes uh, that distinguish IO read write from normal load store. Okay, so instead of saying load word some value to some address, you probably have a new instruction that would say, you know, write this particular word. Uh, to, to this particular command register. So there will be a different instruction for doing that. Okay. So the, the path will still be same, identical, exactly. Okay. Except that the processor will not really look up the TLB to figure out what to do. Instead, the instruction will tell it to bypass caches, and the rest of the things will be same from this point on. So how do you write or read a stream of bytes? So uh, usually uh, the sys write system call writes a stream of bytes to your device. And sys read reads a stream of bytes from IO device. For example, when you say scanf, at some point it gets transferred to a read system okay, from your standard input device, standard input stream. Okay. Similarly, when you want when you want to print something to a monitor, at some point that will be transferred to a write system, which would write to the to a video memory. Okay. So the question now is that how do you really synchronize with the CPU? The, the IO device are doing certain things, how do you synchronize with the CPU? So first solution is to poll, that is you read IO device status register continuously uh, to know whether the particular, uh, for example, let's say you're reading certain bytes, you want to know when it is done. Okay. So you poll certain IO device status register continuously and find out you know, that that status register will change the status whenever the read completes. Okay. So that wastes a lot of CPU cycles, especially in multi-programming supported, which is always true. Second solution is to send an interrupt. IO device sends a hardware interrupt to CPU. So what really happens in this case is that whenever the interrupt arrives, the program counter will change to something, a constant value, which where the, the, the first few instruction of the interrupt handler has to be written. And from there, you can jump to your chosen subroutine, which actually do certain things. Okay. So that's normally called the interrupt subroutine or ISR. So the interrupt handler decides what to do based on the interrupt number. Uh, and this is the most popular and efficient solution and normally used with all IO devices. The polling is almost never used. So often for transferring data from and to memory, you usually use direct memory access, which does not interrupt the CPU. Because interrupting the CPU for every file transfer may be too much. So often IO devices come with a bus master known as DNA engine or IO processor. 
So how do you how do you um, how do we uh, operate the DMA engine? So CPU writes to control registers of the DMA engine with the starting address of the target or source uh, memory block and number of bytes to transfer. Right? So it's, it specifies the source memory address, specifies the target memory access, and then and then triggers the DMA engine it will copy from here to there. Right? But the CPU can work on something. So DMA engine arbitrates from the front side bus and transfers data on its own. Okay. Uh, this is also known as bus cycle steel. Remember that uh, this arbitration is needed because the DMA engine may have to query the caches to make sure that the most accurate data is copied from uh, the source address to the target address. Because certain data may actually be decided in the cache of the bus, which may not really be here. Okay. So certain things may actually be on this side. So DMA engine will actually uh, send interventions down to the caches, retrieve the data and write to the target. And when it is done, it sends an interrupt to the CPU notifying the completion of the DMA transfer. And the interrupt handler will probably do some cleanup work and that completes the call. Some DMA engines can transfer from multiple addresses, also known as scatter cache. For example, you may specify a list of addresses as a source and another list of addresses as a target. So it will actually copy board from this address to that this address to there, this address to there, and so on. Okay, so it can scatter certain bytes and also uh, can gather some bytes. Okay, so um, one of the IO devices that you often use is the magnetic disk. So the access latency for a disk uh, is normally broken down into these five um, uh, components. The first one is the waiting time where the request comes and waits in a queue. Then you have a seek time. So how does the how does the disk look like? So we have a bunch of ladders. And if I look at a particular track here, and if I take each of these tracks, on the different surfaces. So each surface will have a head. So this is normally called a cylinder that connects, not really physically connect, but logically that connects the, the, the same track on each of the surfaces. Right? And each track is normally divided into blocks of data called sectors. So this could be for example 512 bytes or one kilobyte depending on how the operating system configures the sector size. Okay. So um, the first thing that you have to do to read a particular data somewhere, um, so, so essentially there are two things, right? So suppose you want to read a data here. Okay. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to bring the head on this particular sample, all right? And then make sure that the head comes to this particular point to read the data. So moving the head to be positioned on this particular circle is called the seek time. Right? So this particular mechanical assembly will move to make sure that the head is positioned somewhere on this side. Right? And after that the head doesn't move. What happens is that your disk assembly will now rotate to bring this cross under the head. Right? So that's called the rotation. Right? And then you start reading there's some transfer time that, that it takes to get the data from the disk to the disk controller. Okay, all right? And then the controller will take some time to send the data back to your uh, your your memory. Okay, so through this particular path. Right? So that's how you copy some data from disk to the memory. Okay. So usually among these five components, this is the largest sync time. So that's what normally dominates. Because uh, this is a purely mechanical activity that causes your head to move uh, to be positioned on the on this particular track. Okay. And there are certain optimizations that people do. One of the common ones uh, is read ahead. So essentially what you do is that if you are currently reading this center, you might want to read the next sequential center as well. Okay. And depending on your on your data layout. The next sequential sector may be on the next surface on the same track or maybe on the same sur surface continuous next sector on the 
same track. It depends on how you really lay out the sectors and, and, uh, and, uh, and on, on, the, on the cylinders. But nonetheless, what the, what the idea is that it exploits spatial mobility. And uh, you normally, when you read ahead, what you do is that you put the data from disk uh, to, a, to an area called a disk cache. So that's still here, a reserved area in the memory that's configured to be the disk cache. Okay. Right. Um, the disk controller will also have some small amount of cache, but that's not much actually. Okay. Um, and transfer from the disk cache is normally much faster. Is there a temporal locality? Multiple cache? No. no, there is just one cache, let's assume that. Okay, we're not really worried about the exact configuration. There is just one blob of data. Right? What I'm asking is that is there a reuse? That's temporal locality. So I'm, I'm currently reading this particular sector. Uh, first, it will be read to the disk cache, and then it will be transferred to the to the CPU. Uh, so, so if I have a disk cache inside my disk controller, should I be doing something smart about the replacement policy of the disk cache to exploit temporal locality? Is there a chance that the, the disk cache will see some reuse of this particular piece of data? The answer is very unlikely. The reason is that. The CPU will be pulling out data from here. It doesn't really talk to the disk. Okay. And most likely, today that given the memory sizes, the CPU will make full use of that particular sector of data before it gets evicted from the memory back to the disk. Okay. So it's most unlikely that the disk cache will actually see any reuse of the data. So this is just serving as a spatial locality agent, nothing else. Okay. This is just streaming in data, putting it, staging it there, so that before it sees the next request, it's just prefetching, nothing else. Right? So that's and, and there are many other optimizations for, for improving uh, disk uh, performance, uh, both at the hardware level and at the operating system level. Okay. What we'll uh, focus our attention on a little bit is on uh, is disk arrays, uh, because this is important for reliability, as you can guess, because if you have an array of disks, uh, you can probably introduce some of redundancy of data so that even if one disk fails, I can get the data from somewhere else. However, this adds one more level of control, that's the array control. So on top of the disk controller, there will be an array control, which will send commands to disk controllers, the array of disk controllers. So what is reliability? Reliability of a system is measured in terms of mean time to fail. Right? So essentially, how frequently my system fails. That's the measure of reliability of the system. And availability of a system is quantified as mean time to failure over mean time between failure. And mean time between failure is mean time to failure plus mean time to recover. Right? So um, here the hope is that the recovery time will be small. Okay? So that um, uh, so that this number is going to be pretty large. Which means that most of the most of the time my system is available. But if the recovery time is large, then essentially during the recovery time, my system will not be active, which is not good. Dependability of a system can be derived from its reliability and availability. And large storage systems are prone to failure. Um, however, user is happy as long as he or she does not lose any data. So that is the primary goal of a storage system, that a user should not lose data. Right? So, so that's why reliability is very important. Presence of redundancy in storage structure helps recover from failure gracefully. So given that storage systems fail, we must have some mechanism to recover data if it outbreaks. Okay, and we're going to see some of the mechanisms of this. So redundancy is used in other places also to improve reliability and dependability, uh, not just limited to disks. So again, an example from processor design. Uh, IBM 390 mainframe offers a good example. So this system, it's an old system. It had 14 processors. Some are built in spares to be used in case of processor fails. So not all of them were all the time in use, actually. Some of them were actually spares. All right. Within each processor, certain pipeline resources are duplicated, like the fetcher, decoder, enable, function units, in one cache, So essentially, you have two pipelines. All right. And both the pipelines will compute the same instruction. In parallel. Two results coming out of the duplicate instruction pipelines are compared to detect failure. Of course, here the assumption is that. What is the assumption? 
but it's not going to work. I compare two results, they don't match. I conclude that there is a failure. Of course, one must have failed. That's pretty obvious. I compare both of them match, I conclude that there is no failure. Is that correct all the time? Why doesn't it work? In both cases. In both cases, exactly. So if both the pipelines fail in the same way, they will produce the same result, both of which are wrong. Right? Although the probability of that happening is very, very low. Right? Which is why most of the time it will work. So if the results match, the processor state is check pointed in case the next instruction fails. Right? So that you can roll back. If the results don't match, the processor rolls back to the previous check point, which is the previous instruction. And we try the failed instructions many times to see if the fault was actually transient or permanent. So if really the fault was permanent, then the hot swapping takes a second. The hot swapping means that you swap the failed processor with a spare one. And that happens automatically. That takes about a second. Which is actually huge. So that's the time when your system will not be available. That's the mean time to recover. Anyway, so that was uh, just a digression to show that you know, redundancy helps in all cases. Um, could we improve this a little bit instead of having two pipelines? If I give you three pipelines, let's help. Failure and, and recover if it's a transient failure. If both the prime factors fail, then of course we cannot. We cannot detect uh, of course there's a question of recovery. With three pipelines, what else can we do? But we cannot do with three pipelines. Does it help in any way? So with three pipelines, what do I do? I get three results and then what if they don't match? So suppose the three results are are not identical. If two of them match, then we can use that. that right, exactly. Correct one. So I can take a majority vote. Yeah. Right? I can take a majority vote. So if one one result doesn't match with the other two, I can still go ahead and assume that the other two are correct. Right? Okay. And uh, take the majority vote. But the question is, in what way does it help compared to two by ones? I'm giving you more redundancy. Does it help? It is saving our time. Sorry? It's saving our time. We don't it, have it's to what? We don't have to re execute the instruction. You don't have to? Re execute the instruction. Re instruction. Exactly. So so in this case, if one fails, uh, if, if they don't match, I would actually have to go back and re execute to get the correct result. If I have three, then I, I can take the majority vote and believe the vote and go ahead. Right? Okay. I can save some over it. Okay, so uh, redundant array of inexpensive disks. Um, so this this is a proposal from University of California, Berkeley, um, and uh, over time it has actually become an industry standard. So, um, so as the name suggests, it's basically an array of uh, disks and with some redundancy built in. So the array of disks provide parallelism. That was the main goal of if you just remove the R from the from the beginning, if you just have A array of inexpensive disks, what you gain is parallelism. Right? It gives you more throughput. So what you can do is you can stripe data across disks to, to get more throughput. So what what do we mean by striping? So 
So let's suppose these are my three disks. So I will actually, instead of putting sequential data in one disk fully and then moving on to the other disk, what I'll do is I'll go like this. So I'll put a block of 512 bytes here, the next block here, the next block here, the next block here, and so on. All right? So that uh, I can make sequential accesses to uh, parallel disks. Okay? And I can get the throughput. However, latency remains unchanged. Okay? Because none of the disks are actually any faster than uh, so, uh, the array doesn't really improve the speed of the disks. They still remain as slow as they were. <coughs> what is the disadvantage? Array of disks has lower dependability compared to a single disk. Why is that? If the probability of failure of a single disk is P, then what is it for n disks? Sorry? P by n. P by n. Sorry? What options do I have? P to the power of n. P to the power of n. Is it smaller or larger? Smaller. Sorry? Smaller. Larger? Smaller. Smaller. Why? Because probability will be less than 1. Less than 1. Exactly. Right. So as you raise it to a power, the value actually goes down. So, um, so, so that's what is mentioned here. Right? If you have an array of disks, the, the, the probability, so, so the probability of failure of one disk is p. So if I ask you, if I give an array of n disks, what is the probability that at least one disk will fail? What is it? So this is the probability of failure. Failure of single disk. Give you n disks, what is the probability that at least one disk will fail? N into n into p to the p into one minus p to the power. Sorry, say again. And what is the probability that nothing, nothing fails? Uh, one plus p is Sorry, say again. One. One plus p. Uh, it's for one disk. Uh, sorry. This you should be able to answer. What is the probability that at least one disk fails in an array of n disks? One minus one minus p to the power. One minus p. One minus one minus p to the power. One minus one minus p. And here, how do we call it? Okay. Which one is larger? P or this one? So this one is failure of at least one. Which one is larger? This one is larger? Suppose 1 minus p is q. So this is 1 minus q. Which one is larger? one disk fails is much higher than failure of a single disk query. Okay. So that's what is mentioned here. So redundant arrays tries to bridge this particular gap. It says that well, 
we have an array of disks, so you have throughput, but you have this particular problem. Gravity of failure goes up. Okay, right? So can I bridge the gap with reference? So essentially what that means is that there must be a possibility of reconstructing lost data if there is a difference. <coughs> so the good news is that MPTR is much less than MPTF. So reference can make reliability of 100 disks much higher than a single one. So the question remains how to, record, how to discover faults. So uh, these sectors hold error detection and error correction codes. So a simple one would be single error correct, double error detect. So how do you do this actually? Which means I I must be I must be coding my data in such a way that I will be correct correct one one error and detect two errors. Can you suggest a simple way of doing that? A simple coding scheme. So so forget about this. Okay. So let Let's abstract away the details and let's assume that I want to transmit say n bits over a noisy channel. Right? And, I, and I want the receiver to be able to do seg that. Similar error correct double error detect. And I'm not worried about how much extra bits I have to transmit to be able to do this. So can you suggest a simple protocol? Counting the number of ones. Sorry? Counting the number of ones. Can you detect double errors? I flip one 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 particular bit from one to zero, other one from zero to one. You remain exactly the same number of ones. We can calculate the hash of that pattern. You have to give a guarantee here. I must be able to do that, same time. Transmitting just one packet of data. I don't have any packets. And the receiver should be able to correct one error, detect two errors. receiver checks three bits in blocks. Okay, right? If all of them are not same, then you're sure that there is an error. Okay, all right? And if there is one error, you can correct it. Because you can look at the other two and just you know you know what the correct one is. Okay, right? If there are two errors, can you detect that? Sorry? Only if you look at the value of all the bits that you can detect this. Only if you look at the? All the disk. Only if you compare all the value of all the disk. No, there is no disk. I'm, I'm just transmitting n bits over a channel. Okay. So, if I look at. In case the world is variable, but. Uh, Sorry? In case the technology is not so possible, but the world is very variable. Yeah, no, I want to guarantee it. You cannot, right? Yeah. So, but can you? One more copy. You need one more copy of? Sorry, saying what? So, does everybody see that repeating the bit thrice doesn't help, right? You cannot detect double errors. You can detect an error, you can correct it if there is one error. What else can you do? What if I transmit the XOR of all the bits also? I repeat every bit thrice. So I send three bits. I send one more extra bit, which is XOR of all the bits. Will that help? Detecting two errors. Why? I mean, we can have 
have the error in the Excel bit also, no? Then, like, uh, if there is an error, we send one and... Yes, okay. So, let, let's assume that the, the parity bit cannot be corrupt. Mm -hmm. Excel bit can be corrupt. Yeah. Then, yeah. then you can do that, right? So, okay, so there are many other ways of doing this, but, but I'll, not, I'll not go to that. Um, point here is that um, you, can, you can, if you attach error detection correction codes, um, you can recover from errors. Um, and hot swapping with hot spares enables very high availability and dependability, uh, which is important for file rate server. So, let's look at some of the rate. Uh, levels. And, and also we'll look at some of the coding examples. That, that, uh, so RAID offers several levels of fault tolerance. Um, RAID 0 is no redundancy. <coughs> Basically, plain striking is used to improve throughput. Um, so this is this is just very similar to memory pack. There is no redundancy error. Right? RAID 1 uses mirroring, requires twice as many disks as RAID 0. So you can read from the disk with smaller seek time. So essentially what I'm doing is that I duplicate every disk. All right? So that's that's my mirror. All right? And since I have now the option of reading the data from two possible disks, I read the one that has the smaller seek time. Now depending on how you organize the disk, you may get RAID 1 0, which is five mirrors, or RAID 0 1, which is mirror stripes. So you can explain that. So this all I have just two data disks. And then I mirror them. So this is essentially mirrored stripes. I first type the data and then mirror it. Right? So, so essentially what I do is I I first do rate zero, right? That's what I did. I did rate zero first, and then applied rate one on the entire disk assembly. Right? The other one which I could do is So I mirror first and then strike it. So that's basically strike mirror. I first apply rate one. Whenever I create a disk, I mirror it first. And then strike it. Okay. Rate two adds error correction codes on top of this. Now here um, the original according to the original publication. Uh, there was really no constraint on what kind of error correction codes you can use. So, for example, you could use uh, the repetition thing that, that he has mentioned, duplicate twice. And different kinds of codes would give you different kinds of uh, recoverability. For example, what, what I could do is also that, um, uh, so here is a scheme which gives you a 50% over it. Okay, so, so, for example, I have four data disks. Okay, right. And what I do is I take the pairs all right, and store the parity in a disk. So I have two error correction disks. So this one exhausts the data here and puts it here. And this one exhausts the data here and puts it here. Okay. So what kind of uh, error correction detection can I do with this? So let me number these, maybe uh, A, B, C, D, E, Q. So B is A XOR B, Q is C XOR B. Can I do single error correction? I can, right? Can I detect two errors? What if both A and B fail? It's over, right? Because XOR will be same. Okay. Right? 
So I can do single error correction here. Um, I can detect single error. That's all I can do. So there is something called Hamming codes. How many of you know? Hamming codes. I'm not talking about the Hamming distance. No. Okay, so um, I, I, I won't get get you details of Hamming code. I'll just tell you what it is. Um, so the original uh, rate uh, to uh, paper actually mentioned Hamming code for this purpose. Okay, right? So what Hamming code does is that normally it's mentioned as a typical income or gain. Um, <coughs> Where n is the size of the total amount of data, that is data plus your uh, error correction code, uh, which is typically for r minus one. So it's an r bit, uh, you know. Uh, so you can, you can, uh, yeah, typically for r minus one, uh, which is the class bit, and out of which the number of actual data bits is this, will be r minus r minus one. So essentially, what it means is that. If you have four data bits, you need three more bits to construct a Hamming code. Okay? And then with those three bits will be essentially error correcting codes. Right? So seven four, for example, is a possible Hamming code. Okay, it turns out that on top of Hamming code, if you add one parity bit, that is, that exhausts all the data bits, you can actually do double error detection and single error correction. So anyway, so uh, this is a more like a theoretical uh, proposal, and uh, industry doesn't really use this in any of the commercial disks. Right? Uh, although uh, rate one zero and rate zero are very popular in the industry, and uh, and, uh, and of course the, the subsequent ones are also. So rate three uses uh, bit unit parity. Um, here you add one extra disk that maintains the sum of all disks modulo two. So it's an example. Um, if two disks fail at the same time, it is impossible to recover. So that's what we have already mentioned in this case also. Okay. So that's rate three. Um, so here's an example for rate three. So let's suppose I want to do a 512 byte read, which is my sector space. Right. So you read the corresponding 512 bytes from the target disk, wherever it is located. In case of failure, you reconstruct the required data from every disk and all other disks. You can do. Right? So, um, so only in case of failure, you have to access all the disks for this particular uh, sector of data. A uh, 512 byte write is actually more expensive. You first read the corresponding 512 bytes from all the disks, except the target one. We copy parity and write parity as well as the original data. Right? So, here. Um, for computing the parity, you will need all the disks. But actually, that's not necessary because of the property of XOR. So that's what is recognized in rate 4, where you reduce the write over it by observing that XOR is self magnifying. So for computing the new parity, you could just do the following old parity, XOR with target blocks, old data, XOR with target blocks, new data. Right? That would give you the new parity. So still, parity remains a bottleneck for that in that right? so because that will be access wherever the parity is stored. Okay. Rate 4 is here, so this is what is rate 4. So these are my three data disks and this one parity disk, right? which exhausts all these data here. So rate 5 uses distributed block interleaved parity. So essentially what it does is that it doesn't fix the parity disk. It distributes the parity all okay. So P0 is here, P1 will be here, P2 will be here, P3 will be here, and again, before it be here, so right. Why is it good? What does it bind? Sorry? The parity disk if it fails, then it becomes a problem in rate four. Well that's still a problem. If P0 gets corrupted. So that block can't be right? sorry? So so B0 uh, So that's how this this fails. I lose P0, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But reducing the overhead on the parity uh, this. Oh? This like on every uh, access, you need to uh, read from the parity bit. Yeah. 
Over here, you don't need that. Like, over here, it's been distributed. Right, so actually, no. So, the reading is not the real problem. The problem was the write. So here, if you wanted to do two uh, back-to-back writes, when you close the space, you, this would be the model. Right? Um, here, you could allow them to go concurrently. So they could here, you can go and here. Yes, you're right. So for reads also, you could do that. But actually, the reads can be read directly from the disk cache. So that was not really the main problem. And RAID 6 maintains two different parity disks, known as P plus P redundancy. Um, gets recovery from two errors possible. So here, what we'll do is, yeah. So um, <coughs> let's take RAID 5. We'll be showing how we do RAID 6. So similarly, you distribute P and Q parity. Now, um, P could be XOR of all the data. Q should be a stronger core okay, if you really want to recover from two errors. Because Q, if, it's, if Q is also an XOR, you get nothing by having Q. Okay. So Q should be a different piece of code, um, which is quote unquote independent of P. Right? So I'm not getting the mathematics of that. Uh, if you're really interested, in how to uh, generate this band, the, the second band, the video I will send you some papers. Okay, so that's about rate. So, um, when you do DMA, the one question that we didn't uh, address is does DMA use virtual address or physical address? So, the way we have described it, it seems that DMA should be physical address because the CPU sends the physical address of uh, the source and target and the rest happens without any intervention of ways or you know, anything. Right? So you copy the physical address source to the target. So let's see the pros and cons of both. If you want to do virtual DMA, that is DMA based on virtual addresses, you will require a DMA in the DMA engine so that you can generate the corresponding physical addresses. And this DMA must be under the control of ways. And it should be kept coherent with your processor DMA. Okay. On the other hand, if you have physical DMA, it has several issues, including security. So um, here are just some questions that, that, that you should think about with physical DMA. So the first fundamental question is what if the amount of data to be transferred is more than a page? When I'm done with the page, where should I go now? Because physical pages are not continuous, they're normally scattered. And normally when you do a DMA, the CPU sets the starting address only. So when you cross a page boundary, you cannot really start driving to the next page. You have to prep it off. You will be going to be sequential. <coughs> OS must copy the entire data to sequential page names before invoking the DMA. What if OS replaces or it relocates a physical page frames which is being used by DMA? So that means to avoid that, you must freeze DMA. So that while a DMA is going on, a page should not get replaced. And OS must copy entire user data to kernel space before DMA is invoked with the security issues. Because what may happen is that through the DMA, a, a particular user can actually start writing to some other space. Because once you start the DMA, there is no security check. There is no check done actually. It's a byte copy from one address space to another. That's it. Okay. So um, to avoid this problem, uh, OS must copy the entire user data to kernel space before DMA is invoked. Right. So, uh, so DMA also has to may have to read from the caches uh, right. what data transfer. Yes. So that would also the caches are virtually that uh, virtually indexed. Right. Yes. And that may also be a problem. Yeah. So we in physical DMA. Yes. So we 
Uh, this is not a special problem of DMA. Uh, in yeah, processors, really even in multiprocessors, this problem may arise because when processor 1 sends a message to processor 2, yes. normally it comes in terms of physical address. Yeah. And the, process, the processor caches are virtually indexed, how do you really do yeah. So we didn't discuss any of these things because uh, I really cannot do that here in this course. It requires a lot of prior uh, exposure to certain, certain concepts. But anyway, so um, these are the problems of uh, you know, virtual versus physical DNA. Uh, Seems that virtual DNA may be easier to support as long as you have a TLD under risk control in the DNA region. Uh, in physical DNA, as long as you restrict your data size to a page, you are probably fine. So till now, we have been mostly discussing about synchronous I.O. That is, uh, whenever you start an I.O. operation, uh, the, the calling process gets switched out. Uh, and some, somebody else comes in and the calling process must wait until the I.O. completes. However, you could do asynchronous I.O. as well, and it has the same developing at one block loads. So essentially here, what we do is, we allow a process to continue even after making an I.O. only request. The process is switched out only when it tries to access some bytes that are part of the I.O. How to do this? The process is a program. So let's, let's suppose that I am, the program has this code in the scan it, Okay. And then I do uh, x plus plus. And if I allow asynchronous IO for the for the STD read, the program will continue execution from here. And here what it asks is that this is the point where you should do the context switch. Not really here. But how do I know that x is not available? Compiler is generated a virtual address. I look up the TLD. I make it a page font. I do a translation. I go and access the physical page. I'll get some value, which is perfect. Off. So how do I really achieve this? This particular thing. You can go higher completion. Yeah, but processor will generate a load instruction. How will you trap it actually? The page point can uh, tell the process that this is a uh, higher This uh, register map, uh, this memory map goes to a higher point. Try saying? The request to the, uh, the it, it will create a page for and May not be. Why do you say so? Because uh, this doesn't have a TLD in Why? This is the I.O. part. So Which is the I.O. part we're talking about? This will generate this, this one here. Yeah. yeah. This is the I.O. request. This will generate an I.O. request. It will generate a system call, yes. Right. So that will be via page for uh, Why? Why should there be page for So how will the uh, I.O. request be in this There will be a system call which will generate a sysread, which will read from your, so at the, at the lowest hardware level, the bytes will be read from the keyboard buffer to some memory area. Their read uh, call is the load function, right? the load instruction. No, I'm talking about part of the system call. Okay. System call handler will read from keyboard buffer into some memory area, and then copy it from the memory area to the to the, to the user space. So the system call handler knows that this is a I.O. Yes, it knows. Yeah, so it can uh, block all the other uh, It can block all the other? Dependence. Which dependence? Mm -hmm. The dependence on this, uh, this register. How does it do that? That's what I'm asking. So processor eventually generates this load instruction, which comes out with an address. Now what do you do? I mean, you may uh, remember that in uh, you know, the, the register. Uh, in the page table, it will remember that. In the page in. Oh. Remember that? that? There was a, there's an IO pending to this page. And the next time when the IO has com completed, only then that bit would be fed to zero. On the next address translation, 
uh, we can check whether that bit is set or not. If it is set, then we have to do a context switch. So, um, so inside the system called handler, at some point, right, the handler has to copy the data from the I/O buffer in the kernel space to this particular address in physical memory, right? That has to happen because processor will be generating this particular load eventually, which will go to that particular address. This address. But right, am I making sense? So what I'm saying is that if you look at the sequence of things that will happen, there's a read system call which will essentially copy from keyboard buffer, whatever that is, to kernel IO buffer. Next step is copy from kernel audio buffer to address of X. So, but how is this in commerce? Yes. This is so previously what would happen is that the, the process would get switched out. Right, immediately, as soon as you execute the system call. Mm -hmm. right? Here, what I'm doing is that I'm allowing the process to continue, basically. Why is this happening? The processor will generate that load instruction eventually. Right? So what you have to do is that, as you have mentioned, in the page table entry, you have to mark that this particular virtual page as a I.O. pending. But to make sure that you actually get to that point, you have to inherit the table before, before uh, you allow the, the, the process to continue. So if you wanted to asynchronous IO, the part of the system call handler would also have to invalidate the TLB if there is any. So that the TLB this will happen and then only the the operating system can take the page table. Right? So that's one way of doing it. There could be other ways also. So now the process <coughs> can have multiple outstanding IO requests and synchronous IO will switch out the process immediately after the system call. As soon as the system call actually happens. I'm going to stop here. This is the last slide. We'll finish it up next time. And then we'll, uh, next week, what we'll do is we'll talk about uh, hyper threading. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of that. Anybody heard of hyper threading? No. Okay, all right. Fine. Which is surprising. So. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's what we're going to invest our time on. Uh, it's kind of a hardware threading mechanic. We have not about trading at the operating system level. So we'll see how to bring that down to hardware. Uh, so that's all we'll spend our next week.